Good. Thank you very, very much for inviting me. Um, they say the best way to get to know people isn't actually to sort of tell them all your good points, but to, uh, you really get to know someone when you find out a few of their weaknesses. So I thought we'd cut to the chase. I'll just go for a couple of weaknesses, then you'll know me, and then we can carry on. Um, the first weakness I have is an extremely large head, uh, and it's challenging <laughs> this particular microphone in terms of staying on. So pray for me throughout. I actually, I actually heard a speaker once say that he was melancholy. And what he meant was he had a head like a melon and a face like a collie. And I felt a huge amount of empathy with him at this point in time. As uh, Rick said, I work for XLP. I work very closely with Patrick. We do an awful lot of the sort of uh, planning and the strategizing together. But really where I come in is to try and build the projects and make them happen. And that weakness comes in because what I've had to fight most of my life is a certain amount of impatience. It's something that comes with the territory. If you want to get things done, sometimes you're a little bit impatient. So I'll give you an idea. A couple of weeks ago, I was out in the middle of Ghana. Uh, not in the capital, but way out where we have a project where we've built a school out there. And we went into one of the townships, and there's a lady that we've known. Uh, Patrick may have spoken to you about her. She's called Aquila. And Patrick talks about the fact she's got the saddest eyes that he's ever seen. And Aquila, she's had about 12 children, but only six of them are still alive. And they're living in one very small uh, room. And next to this room, there's just a derelict area where once, many, many years ago, there was another room. Now, it's my first time out there. I have sent loads of people out to Ghana. And I've always managed to avoid going. But Patrick told me I'd got to go. So I went. And it was quite shocking. I really found it quite disturbing, my first time going into that environment. And I just took one look at this and sort of went into automatic mode and just said, right, we've got to build the other half. And I want it built before I leave, which is only about a week later. So we found a local builder and we started doing all of that. And it sounds great. But actually, impatience can get you into trouble as well. Because we went back to one of the bigger cities to grab a cup of coffee. We parked the car out front. We have a driver in, in, uh, in Ghana. It's not a place you want to drive yourself. We got stopped probably 20 to 30 times by police asking for money. So you tend to have a local driver who knows how to handle it all. So we'd park the car in the car park of this quite big hotel because we wanted to get a cup of coffee and a, a piece of western food because by this time I was struggling. We went and sat down and there were three people with me, including Pastor Acusia, who is the lady who runs the project out there. But again, I'm like, what are we doing next? What's the plan? Where are we going? What are we getting on to? So we dash out the door, knowing what the next one is, and I'm like, right, we need to get moving. And in Ghana, they don't move fast. <laughs> oh, man. So I'm out of the front door, and I'm heading to the car park. I've got my bag in hand, and they're all sort of moseying on behind. I get to the car door where the, you know, where the driver is. I open the door. I sling my bag in. I jump in, and I sit there waiting. It's one of these white pickup vans. And I'm looking, and there's no one coming. And then I look at the bloke in the front, and he's not my driver. <laughs> and I look out the window, and there's my three guests waving at me with our driver. <laughs> so it can get you into awful trouble. And that's, that's fairly much where I have to hold this tension. And if it gives you any consolation, it might not. Youth workers and kids are just like the people in Ghana. You can't rush them. And it's just... <laughs> So that's me, okay, they're my weaknesses. You give me an incredible passage to look at today. And one of the things I was told as well was don't just look at the passage, but also try and share a bit about how Jesus has impacted the life and ministry that we work in. So I'm going to share a little bit about myself, a little bit about XLP, as well as going through the text. I would recommend if you've got a Bible, you're going to find this a heck of a lot more interesting. So if you have one with you, do you want to open it up just so that we can go through this together? And while you're looking that up, I want to read you something just to sort of set the scene. If you've heard it before, bear with me. If you haven't, I hope you enjoy. It's an article that appeared some years ago in a national magazine that's entitled What Women Don't Understand About Men. And it reads like this. Let's say a guy called Roger asks a woman called Elaine out to the cinema. She accepts and they have a pretty good time. And a few days later, he asks her out to dinner. And again, they enjoy themselves. They continue to, uh, to see each other regularly, and soon neither is seeing anybody else. Then one evening, when they're driving home, a thought occurs to Elaine. 
She says, do you realise we've been seeing each other exactly six months? Silence fills the car. To Elaine, it seems like a very loud silence. She's thinking to herself, oh no, I wonder if it bothers him, what I've just said. Maybe he feels confined by a relationship. Maybe he thinks I'm trying to push him into some kind of obligation. And Roger is thinking, gosh, six months. And Elaine is thinking, but I'm not sure what kind of a relationship this is either. Are we headed towards marriage, children, a lifetime together? Am I, all re- or am I ready for that level of commitment? I really don't even know this person, do I? And Roger is thinking, so that means, let me see, that's February, we started going out right after I got the car from the dealer, which means it's due for a service. (laughs) And Elaine is thinking, he's upset, I can see it in his face. Maybe he wants more from our relationship, more intimacy, more commitment. Maybe he senses my reservations. Yes, that's it, he's afraid of being rejected. And Roger is thinking, I'm going to get him to look at the gearbox when it goes in. (laughs) I don't care what they say, it's not changing gear properly. And Elaine is thinking, he's angry and I don't blame him. I'd be angry too. I feel so guilty putting him through all of this. But how can I help the way I feel? I'm just not sure. And Roger is thinking, if he needs any work, I bet they're going to say it's out of guarantee. And Elaine is thinking, maybe I'm too idealistic, waiting for a knight to come riding up on a white horse when I'm sitting next to a perfectly good person who's in pain because of my self-centred schoolgirl fantasy. And Roger is thinking, warranty? I'll give them out a warranty. Roger, Elaine says aloud. What, says Roger? I'm such a fool, Elaine says, sobbing. I mean, there's no knight and there's no horse. There's no horse, says Roger. You think I'm a fool, don't you, sobs Elaine. No, says Roger, just glad to know the right answer. It's just that I need some time, says Elaine. There's about a 15 second pause while Roger tries to come up with a safe response. Yes, he says, finally. (laughs) Elaine, deeply moved, touches his hand. Do you really feel that way, she says. What way, says Roger. (laughs) That way, about time, Elaine says. Oh, says Roger. Yes. (laughs) Elaine gazes deeply into his eyes causing him to become nervous about what she might say next especially if it involves a horse (laughs) at last she says thank you Roger thank you he responds now you see you can see I mean I know that's blowing it out of proportion maybe not but the fact is we do see things very differently don't we and one of the things we're going to discover in this passage is the way that Israel and us often don't really understand the way God's working, don't really understand the way that God's thinking. And part of what Jesus is doing when he's taking the disciples away on this trip is to begin that process of trying to get them to actually think it through. They've just come to an amazing time of seeing all the miracles. They've seen blind people see. They've seen him walking on water. They've seen him feeding thousands of people. They've seen incredible things happen, but they still aren't thinking in the right way. And if we go to the beginning of our text, 8.27. Remember, we're coming on from Bethsaida. And think of this, I mean, Mark's a great author because the story beforehand from Bethsaida is about the healing of the blind man. The blind man actually gets to see. Just think about the disciples. They're starting to see properly. These things are lined up on purpose like this. And Bethsaida is quite a long way. You have to travel about, even on a motorway, you're a good couple of hours um, away from Caesarea Philippi. So they've gone on quite a long hike here. And you get that sense that Jesus has taken them away from all of the situations they've been in. And they're now walking a long distance. And it gives us time to sit and to think and to work out what's going on. And as I said to you, not my strength. But it's one of the things over the years I've had to learn and get to grips with. So Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ. 
Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Do you know there was a temple in Caesarea Philippi? And it was the temple to the newest Roman god, the emperor. I don't know if you know, you've probably had other teachers tell you the same things, but those emperors claimed certain names and titles for themselves. Saviour of the world. You've got the new saviour of the world walking around now near the main temple where the existing saviour of the world is worshipped. And you can start to see why at the end of that passage Jesus says, don't tell anyone. He's actually moving in dangerous territory here. And they're beginning to realise that he's the Christ. Now, what what they're meaning by that at the moment, and they will come to learn so much more later though, is they're beginning to recognise him as the coming king, the king of the kingdom of God. You know this from all we've read before, this expectation that God will send somebody. He will, they're not quite sure what he's, what he's going to look like or whether it's going to be more than one person or whether it's a prophet or whether it's a king. But when you're in that oppressed situation, when you're, you have an overlord nation, then actually what you're looking for is a king, isn't it? You're looking for the alternative king that's going to get you out. And for the first time, they're really acknowledging that Jesus is king. And they're doing it when they've got the space to think this through on the road to Caesarea Philippi and the surrounding villages. And that's the first important thing, I think, I would say that has made a huge impact on my life and on the ministry that we do with XLP. Is it's quite a big thing, thinking through, what does it really mean if Jesus is king? For them there, but also for us in our lives, We're going to come back to this theme as as we go through. But it's a big question. How does it change us? Has it changed us? Has it changed the way we think? The way we we think changes the way we behave, doesn't it? If you believe or think something, you tend to do one thing. If you believe or think a different thing, you'll do something different. And I think Jesus is giving them the chance to actually start to think this through and process this through. They've now realised he's the king. But you see, in those days, they had certain expectations of this king that was going to come. There had been a lot of writing on it. I mean, they suggest, for instance, that he was going to restore the temple. They thought that salvation would come to the kingdom of Israel through the temple. They had notions that somehow the Torah, the scripture, was also some way going to bring salvation, bring release to this oppressed nation of Israel. And in fact, the vision that they had for themselves, that you find very much expressed through the prophets, ironically, was that Israel would kind of look like the Romans, or like the Babylonians, or like the Assyrians. They actually wanted Israel to be on top, and they wanted all the other nations to come and serve them. They wanted it to be like the days of David and Solomon. Again. So not only is Jesus saying... I am the Christ, I am the King. But he needs to give them the space and the time to rethink what that means because Jesus is redefining the whole concept of Messiah, of Christ, in a wholly different way. The disciples are misunderstanding, just like Roger and Elaine. And Jesus is going, you need to think this through. And he goes on to talk, he says, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Again, one of the themes that you find running through the Old Testament is very much built around uh, Israel coming through darkness, a time of darkness, a period of darkness, And not that they're just travelling through it, but actually that darkness is the means by which they will become what God has always intended them to become. So it's not just something to be got through. It's actually the means by which they become what they were always supposed to be. And the disciples haven't really grasped this at this stage. They're still looking of, we've got a king, we want him on the throne, we want the Romans out, we think it's cracking that you're here. Could you please get on with it? And Jesus is going, look back through the scriptures. Remember the guys on the road to Emmaus? 
So when, after the crucifixion, there's those two guys and they're wandering back to Emmaus and they're kind of way miserable because they know what happens to messiahs that have failed. They get killed. And they've had plenty of failed messiahs in their past history. There was one not so many years before Jesus' birth that was um, up in a place called Sepphoris, very near Emmaus. And what the Romans did when that particular messiah came on the scene to try and make himself king was they killed him. But they also crucified 2,000 people and they razed the town to the ground. That's what happened to failed messiahs and the way you were defined as a failed messiah was you got killed because a real messiah wouldn't have that happen to them. So we're going to come to Peter's response in a minute but you can start to see where they're coming from. But Jesus is going back to, if you were in the, um, if you guys read the Chronicles of Narnia, do you remember the term the old magic? It talks about the old magic. And you kind of got that sense that Jesus is going back to the original themes that God put in place and that have been there all the way through the Psalms and all the way through the prophets and right the way through saying actually there is a time of darkness. There is a time, a passage that you will go through that will bring about the new kingdom, will bring about the restoration, will bring about the salvation. But you can't get around it. It's kind of part of the package. And again, something we're not so keen on. You know, in our contemporary culture, we spend a lot of time trying to avoid suffering and get away from sacrificing things and making things convenient. So we have this ancient biblical theme, this motif, and Jesus is starting to draw it out. And in the past, in Scripture, it's always been applied to Israel. But Jesus is now saying, that's me. I'm going through that dark place. You see, cross and kingdom are inextricably linked. And this is the message we're getting here. The kingdom doesn't come without the cross. And in this world, if we're not careful, we focus on the resurrection and the kingdom. Yay! And we kind of push the cross bit to the corner. But actually, it's only through the cross that it's possible for the new heaven, the new earth to come to fruition. It says he spoke plainly about this. I think one of the things we need to understand very, very clearly is that sacrifice and suffering is part of the Christian walk. Here's a a deep, joyful message for you this morning. Nathan doesn't know it yet, but when you get involved in the stuff that we do at XLP, if you're not careful when we present things to congregations like yourselves, we make it sound all great and wonderful. We've had these huge successes. So, and we do have them. I mean, I've listed just a few down here. You may have heard Patrick talk about these. There's this wonderful young lady who about a year ago, we got a phone call from the school where they were saying, Her behaviours are appalling. We can't control her. Her attitudes are off the scale. We're going to kick her out. And we found out about her background. And she got all sorts of issues to do with behaviours, but also she's a a teenage lass and she was being, how can I put it, uh, promiscuous with older blokes and she's got no parents and she's living on a difficult estate and there's only an elderly aunt there with her and all sorts of things that have mashed her up and got her to this situation. They said, look, we'll keep her in school if you give her a mentor. And we went, oh, okay. And we found a lady on the estate. And she's an, actually, she is an amazing lady, but she's no one that would stick out in a crowd. But she opened her heart and she got involved with that young lady. And nine months later, we get a call from the school that says, you know that girl that our teachers were trying to kick out because of her behaviours and everything else? They've just voted her head girl or nominated her to be head girl of the school as a role model to the other kids. And she's now deputy head girl of that school. How cool is that? And that kind of feels like real transformation, doesn't it? Real root change in all of that. And that lady who was involved with the young girl, though, she went through some pain. You don't engage with kids like that, Matt will tell you. You don't engage with kids like that 
without embracing a lot of suffering and a lot of sacrifice on your part. We've got kids, after six months, we've had them with us. 19 kids have now got jobs who've got very little education, if any. And they've come through a process with us and we've actually got them jobs and they're actually working for Barclays now, in branches, a real firm as well, and they've got career thing opportunities coming through. It's just stunning and amazing. We've even got guys that work with Matt and I and Sarah who are from the gang's world, who've come out of it changed their lives around, been mentored and helped by people in XLP and are now on staff doing the same thing. You've probably met some of them. But then there's the other cases. There's the boy whose mum's got mental health issues and an alcoholic and she never comes out of the flat and he's trying to bring up three younger brothers and sisters as well as get himself through his own education. And then there's another three kids um, down the south side of the river where dad's just died of cancer and there's no mum present and they're faced with going into care. And there's one lady who Matt and I work with very closely who on the 1st of August this year, her husband rang me at about 7 o'clock in the morning and this lady has worked to help young people for the last 20, 30 years in drugs and alcohol rehabilitation, always focused on young people. And she's working for us now with some of the most damaged young people we've got. And she throws her entire life to help them. And her own 16-year-old son, three days after his 16th birthday, was stabbed through the heart. And that's what they were ringing to tell me, that he was dead. And you look at it and you go, you engage with those guys then you have to embrace the notion of suffering and sacrifice. If you're going to sit with that, that, that lady when her son is gone, it will rip your heart out if you want to get alongside and help her. If you want to work with those kids uh, whose father has just died, there's some serious commitment involved if you're going to help those kids and stop them going into care. And it's going to be painful. Three young kids losing their father like that. Can you imagine what they're going through? Getting involved in the life of that young man and the mental health issues, which are incredibly hard to work with, it involves a huge amount of sacrifice of time, energy, emotion. And I think sometimes we forget that that's part of the cross. That's part of what we're called to be. When we're called to make Jesus king, we're called to be followers of Jesus. And in this part, in this section of the scripture, we're finding Jesus actually saying, you know what, I'm going to give everything, my all, for everyone who's here and everyone out there. God so loved the world, not just the church, that he gave his only son. And Jesus is saying, I give you all, I give it to you all. And you realise the sacrifice when you read it in Jesus' story. But I think we still need to start to understand in the church in the same way as Jesus had those disciples on the road and they had to start thinking it through and processing it and going, we need to bring some more of the cross back into our theology, into our teaching. Some more of the sacrifice, some more of the suffering. Because the Bible tells us from the old magic, that's the way that the new heaven and the new earth and the new creation and the restoration of communities will happen. And we can't skip around it. We can't divert and avoid it. I was sat in XLP meetings and it was probably one of the things that made me stay and get involved. On a Monday morning we all get together and all the stuff that's going really, really well comes out and all the stuff that's not going so well comes out. And there was one lady that we had years ago called Charlotte. And Charlotte worked for us for nine years on arguably one of the biggest and most difficult estates in London and we used to show up there and I guarantee you every other Monday she was in tears and more often than not it was because we'd lost the young man who'd been stabbed or he'd died or he was in hospital and what you realised was that Charlotte had got to know the families so well she'd got to know the kids so well three or four years she'd been working with them they were like losing her brothers and sisters 
And she was having to go through grieving the loss each time one of these things happened. And every instinct and fibre within people, particularly people like me, is to shut that out, close it off, protect myself from it. It's too hard. It's hard enough when it's our own families, because we all have things that we go through, don't we? It's hard enough when it's our own families. But if we start letting too many people in, but it's the only way that we'll see the kingdom come. And what Jesus is saying is if I'm king, then there's a path to be trod. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It doesn't get much clearer, but it's so easily read over and we move on to another, another story of healing. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever wants to lose his life for me and for the gospel will save it. It's that wonderful sort of way of representing this old magic. You do understand what I mean by old magic, don't you? Yeah, excellent. Just check in. <laughs> don't want to go away and think that you think that's something very odd of me. You have to get to grips with this part and hold it in balance. The resurrection came through the cross. It's the only way forwards. There's something I want to explain. If you get involved in this type of work and you open your heart up to this extent, and some of you here I, I, I get do, if you only get to see those little bits and your only picture of what God is doing is those little bits, I honestly believe it'll drive you mad. The only way you can do this work is if you start to get the big picture of what God is up to. Steve Chalk, in this week's Christianity, most fortuitous that he wrote this, he, has, he started to engage with a number of Jewish uh, people, particularly around what happened during the Holocaust, and particularly around Auschwitz. And he said he discovered something when he did his research. What he discovered was that the people in Auschwitz and the people in the concentration camps actually had children. And he thought to himself, what on earth could have possessed a couple in that situation to, to have a child? It just sounds completely wrong, doesn't it? So he went to one of the people that was there and he said to them, what is it? Why? How did, what happened? And the guy looked at him and he said, it's Torah. And he went, huh? And he said, let me read you this. He said, from generation to generation, they've passed down this vision of what God has intended. God said, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make you a great name and you will be a blessing. I will be a blessing... I will, be a, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you and all the people on earth will be blessed through you. The things those guys had got was the bigger picture. And yes, they were going through a time of darkness and it was a huge struggle. But they were still holding on to the new heaven, new earth, the new creation that God had always planned for them to be. And again, I think something that we might want to take a long walk towards Caesarea Philippi and go, we've got to find that bigger picture, that bigger vision for the kingdom and find our place within it because then actually going through the dark stuff starts to have a context and make some sense. And I would say from my time working with XLP and seeing some amazing people engaged with it, what I've learned from those guys and I think Jesus has shown me through those guys is an ability to embrace the struggle, but also an ability to hold on to the vision of the kingdom. And this is why, whenever, you've probably heard Patrick talk about it a thousand times, I refer you to every DVD he's done in the last year about new heaven and new earth. And the picture being something like that family, the mum's restored, she's not got mental health issues, she's not got alcohol issues, the three kids are doing well in school and they're growing. And the family who've lost the father. You know, the, image, the, the, the picture of the kingdom is a restoration where those kids get to meet their dad again. And he's whole and he's not suffering. Hannah, 
goes through a life and only ever knowing Nathaniel at the age of 16. But she's reunited with him. And that they grow. And that there's more than just this life to what we're doing. The kingdom starts now and goes on forever. It doesn't start when you die and go on forever. It starts now and goes on forever. And us engaging with each other and sharing the pain. And sharing the pain with the people that are outside of the church as well. Um, Karl Medeiros has just written a new book. He's got a wonderful little line in it. It's a, it's a bit hurtful. Maybe. He says, if Jesus was to come today, where do you think he'd go? From the people he actually met when he was down last time, would he be here or out there? Would he be chatting to us or chatting to them struggling? Interesting thought, isn't it? And you kind of go, yeah, because it's about embracing the pain of the community and the world around you. But not just through an idealistic idea that it's helping somebody and not necessarily just through, well, I'm doing my little bit because I think that's short term. But through the fact that we are all working to see the glory and the kingdom of God come. And that's the final goal. That's what we're called to be doing. So we, I've learned that we have to travel through the dark times. I've learned that we, I have to embrace some of this suffering for the purposes of the kingdom. I've also learned that God will overcome. You'll notice son of God is used twice in this particular text. Sorry, son of man is used twice in this particular text. And the son of man, it comes from the Daniel 7. And if you read Daniel 7, you'll find basically Israel is getting beaten up left, right and centre. There's, uh, there's empire after empire after empire after empire taking them through the dark times. And then it gets to this final bit where the Son of Man representing Israel is accepted by God and the kingdom comes and he rules. And you see those allusions from Jesus in this text to the Son of Man are about saying yes, there will be the dark times, yes, there will be the suffering but actually it's for the glory that comes at the end and that's why you've got to do it and that's why we've got to do it together. I want to do one final thing, and if I overrun my time by a huge amount, or excellent news. I want to do one final thing, because that's serious stuff, isn't it? I hope you're thinking, I need to take a long walk, about two hours along a road somewhere, and think some of this stuff through. And so I go, how does that work for me? Well, as so often with these things, it, I think for me, resolves down to something quite simple. And it goes right the way back to the beginning where, they said, Jesus, where this, Jesus uh, said to them, who, are, who am I? And they said, you're the Messiah, you're the King. And it's about where does Jesus sit in your life? Because it's going to drive what you do and how you think. And I just want to borrow a couple of people. I'm going to borrow Rod and Ed and four seats. And I want to leave you with this image. Can I get you to put them up there, sort of two rows like that? That's it. And those behind. Wonderful stuff. And uh, Rod, can I get you to sit in there? Yeah. And uh, can I get you to stand over there for a sec? I'll be coming back to you in a minute. So we're in the car, and Rod's driving. Excellent. You always test out their acting abilities with this one. And Rod's driving and he's going along his life and whatever happens at the moment, Jesus is nowhere to be seen. He's not influencing Rod. He's not telling Rod what to do. He could be going uh, to be an extremely good driver, an extremely bad driver, but he's going on his way. And for some people, you're living in the world like that. Actually, you don't even know who Jesus is. And actually, you're not finding yourself caught up in this wonderful story of recreation and renewing that's going on. Keep driving. <laughs> and if that's you today, then you need to find someone here who is part of that. Come and talk to Rick. Come and talk to, to Rod or Ed. You need to understand where you fit in the whole of this wonderful world and beyond. Can I get you just to kneel down over there? Some of us, we've taken that step. We've sort of said... Um, 
No talking, no talking. No, no. no. Down, down, down. That's it. Some of us, we've got Jesus in the boot. Right? We've kind of accepted him into our lives. But that's about as far as it's gone. Not a whole lot has changed. If you, if you reflect over your life and go, what changed since Jesus came into my life? And you sort of go, a mm, little bit. Go to church more. And you can't really hear him. You get the occasional knock in the back that you might hear if it's a bit quiet. But you can't hear him. Can I get you to see that? Some of us, we've gone a bit further. We've got Jesus on the back seat. And we're still in charge, we're still driving down the road, and we're doing our things, our way, whether it's good or it's bad, we don't know. We're just going ahead with it. With this model, occasionally, we get into trouble. You know what I mean? We've had a really bad day, something's gone incredibly wrong, and we go, oh, and we just lean over, and we ask him. And we have that quick conversation. But that is still, isn't really putting Jesus in the right place. Some of us, Put him in the front seat. And this is because we quite like what he's got to say. But we're still not prepared to hand over the steering wheel, for heaven's sake. I mean, why would we want to do that? So we chat with him, we talk with him, we pray with him and everything else. And he says some great stuff and we take what we like and we probably leave what we don't like. And we just carry on and we're in charge of our life. (laughs) Keep driving. Keep driving. Some of us have even got to the point of letting Jesus sit on our laps, but we're still not letting go of the steering wheel. We're that close. We love him to bits. We're here, we're sharing and everything, but I've still got the steering wheel and I'm not going to let it go. And as a result, we're still going down the way that I want to go, whether it's good or it's bad. You sit there. Finally, and the question that I think Jesus was asking was, who am I to you? Who am I to you, Peter? And Peter said, you're the Messiah, you're the Saviour, you're the King, you're in charge. And the point where we finally get to let Jesus in charge, you'd like to say, yes, and that's when it all gets really good. And that's when the pain starts. That's when the suffering starts. That's when the sacrifice starts. But you can't get where you need to go without putting Jesus in the driving seat. And I don't know about you, some of you may empathise with this model. Occasionally, I have him driving, and then I put him back in the boot. Or I shovel him to the left-hand side. And the more I go on in my Christian walk, and the more that I learn through the people at XLP and the people that we serve, the more I hope I begin to recognise when I've done that. And I have to sit down and say, no... You're my Messiah, you're my Saviour, you're my King. I need to put you back in the driving seat. So, my parting gift to you today, I'd ask you really seriously to think about those things. The cross and the kingdom, inextricably linked. If we're avoiding the cross, we won't see the kingdom. And secondly, where have you put him? Is he in the boot? Is he on the back seat? The seat next to you, even sitting on your lap, isn't good enough. Will you let him drive? And again, reflect on it. Let it seep deep within. Get to recognise it. I hope that's been helpful. Can I just pray? That would be all right, Pastor Rick. Would you guys like to sit down? Thank you ever so much. Can I just say, your church has been engaged with XLP for an awful long time now, isn't it? We do want to offer our, in the style of the old epistles, we do want to offer our greetings and thanks to you guys. Much of what's been done through XLP could not have been done if it wasn't for Rick and the leadership and you guys supporting us, hosting the likes of Matt, which I know is part of the suffering and the pain. Um, but seriously, hosting Sarah and Matt and Leanne and Nicola before that, um, you guys are a huge part of what we do. And uh, if you ever want to come and see, visit, if you want to embrace any of the work that Matt's doing around the mentoring particularly, uh, which really is tough stuff, um, please go and see him. But we, we want to offer up a big thanks and say we love you guys over here, okay? Let me pray.